Hello, I'm going to talk about uh, Darwin's Doubt again. I'm going to continue this on, and this time I'm going to look at his, probably his weightiest chapter, or at least the one that's off, the most often brought up to me as um, irrefutable, which is chapter 9, Combinatorial Inflation, okay? Um, and this is, cause this is kind of a tough chapter. I mean, it's got, a, there's, first of all, the, one of the things about it is that it heavily relies on sources from 1966 Wistar Conference. I think it's 1966. Um, which was a, a meeting that was that was gotten together of uh, computer specialists, mathematicians, information theorists, and evolutionary biologists, uh, where they discussed the possibilities or the probabilities of the origin of life or the creation of life. Um, not creation as in creation, creation as in the origination. The if if life was likely to have occurred by natural means or not, um, which you know obviously. I believe it has been, but that's, you know, that's a side, an aside. Um, what am I going with this? Holy smokes. So anyway, um, the book that these are, these are all bound together into a book, a conference uh, report. Um, the book is extremely expensive and out, outside of my price range, um, at least the one, the copies that I've seen for sale. But I did manage to go and interlibrary loan the relevant talks that Meyer cites. Okay. And I highly recommend doing that. Look up if you if you don't have Dar Darwin's doubt, go to Amazon. Look at the look inside feature. Look at his references, um, and just obtain these because they are hilarious. Um, it's not very often that an information theorist or a, uh, a paper you could say is hilarious um, because this is what's funny to me. If you read Meyer, um, Meyer Meyer's account of this Wistar conference was that it was like these all these great the geniuses of the time all got together and thoroughly trounced Darwinian evolution and left the biologists dumbfounded and, and, you know, incapable of any responses. And, you know, that's, and that's how it still stands today. You know, we, we all know evolution's impossible, right? Um, anyway, that's his take on it. But then when you read the actual, the actual, uh, papers like this one right here, this is probably my favorite. Uh, this is by Dr. Marcel P. Schutzenberger, uh, who did a, uh, he did computer, uh, some of the early work with uh, what do you call it computer modeling uh, testing the possibility of of how how many changes could be made to a protein before it loses all function in other words if you're going to say one protein evolves into another protein um, then how how many changes could it take before the protein just is no longer of, of any value. And he used a computer to do this. Um, you know, it's all fine and good. Um, he came up with some incredible numbers, 10 to the negative 1,000 uh, as, as the odds of a protein spontaneously forming or any changes to a protein. So you think, well, that's, that's pretty solid, right? That supports Meyer's work. But what Meyer doesn't go into, I mean, I, didn't, I don't, wouldn't expect him to, but... Um, is that after each of these talks, these are, this is the transcription of a talk. After the talk, there is a discussion. Um, the discussion is basically the question and answer where the other people in the audience or the other people attending the conference uh, attempt to either get answers, get confirmation, um, or show that the speaker is just way off base. And this time, um, for this segment, uh, Dr. Lou Wanton, was in the audience, uh, one of the great evolutionary biologists, and he's going on and on um, about Richard Lewontin. He so Schutzenberger says there's no possible way. You know, you make the smallest change to any protein and you kill it. So therefore, no evolution is possible with proteins. And Lewontin just starts naming off examples of where we know for a fact, like uh, trypt tryptophan, tryptophan in proteins. Um, Let's see, is that tryptophan, synthesizing tryptophan? Where does he go into this here? This is awesome. Um, but anyway, fast, screw it. Um, so he goes into, the, the point is, is that Lewontin starts naming examples of where there's a, a single protein family with hundreds of different variants, um, and they are completely functional proteins with significant changes in the, the residues. So, you know, it, anyway, and the guy just keeps going back to, but my model, but my computer model. And finally, the chairman of the meeting steps in and goes, we are not interested in your computers. It's hilarious. Anyway, the point is, is that these guys, the information, the pure information theorists and stuff, not that they're, they're not biologists. 
But the biologist trounced him during these talks. Uh, so this wasn't this win, big win for this thing that would one day be known as intelligent design one day, okay? They just, they, they don't, anyway, that's ridiculous. But this is what I'm going to get into. Um, this is going to be too long. I apologize. You guys, I don't know why anybody bothers to listen to me. Um, it's kind of ridiculous. So he goes into, this is it. You can't really see. That's okay. Um, but it's a bike lock. He uses this example of oh, derp of a bike lock um, to show the odds of creating a protein from scratch. And he starts with a bike lock with three dials, ten pos you know, ten numbers per dial. That's one thousand possible combinations. Um, and it goes up, showing more and more and more um, until you get to when there's one hundred dials with 10 digits, you get 10 to the 100 possible combinations. <clears throat> so Meyer uses this um, analogy of the bike lock to show that a protein, now proteins have residues, amino acids, uh, chains of them, typically over 50 amino acids. Uh, most commonly, they're up into the hundreds. Hundreds of amino acids arranged in a fairly precise order. There's 20 possible, roughly 20 possible amino acids that can be in each place. Therefore, this bike lock has the 20 raised to the power of, that's the number of residues the protein contains. So a 100 residue protein is 20 to the 100 possible combinations. If that, hopefully that makes sense. So, but, um, so he uses this to show that if you, uh, you know, you take 100, or you take 100 randomized amino acids and stick them together and get it, you know, the chances of getting a functional protein are pretty close to zero, uh, even if you do it, you know, every a billion times a second for the entire lifespan of the universe, right? Because there's just simply too many possible combinations. Um, but there's a big flaw with that. And I mean a huge flaw uh, with his bike lock analogy. It's a fine analogy to show if you want to talk about, you know, uh, the, the big numbers are derived. Um, but there's nobody working with origin of life research. Not not nobody that I've ever seen. I, and I read a lot of this, this stuff um, that thinks that the an organism with a brand new protein, that that protein arose because all 100 amino acids just got shoveled up, bundled into a ball, or a ball, into a jar, and then randomly assorted and suddenly, amazingly enough, created a functional protein. Proteins arise from mutations in other proteins. Um, now you can get back to the first protein and say, well, what about that one? Um, but that's that's sort of a different thing, uh, a different, I mean, that's a different question that we're talking about origin of life. He's talking about the, the origin or how new proteins arise in a particular lineage. And since, you know, we have humans have X number of unique proteins from chimpanzees, what are the odds that those proteins could have evolved in six million years? He, he doesn't use that specific example, but other, other ID theorists have. <clears throat> Um, anyway, so, so that right there is, is wrong, but then this is the beautiful thing. Um, now you look at this and now this is his, his calculations. Um, and then he cites a number of others are all, uh, hypotheticals, meaning, I mean, they're ones that, you know, people plug numbers into a computer, plug numbers into their calculator and they come up with these numbers and go, well, evolution's impossible. Look at that. Look at those big giant numbers we have. Um, but it's not. It's not necessarily experimentally derived, um, but then when you start looking at the literature on this, um, I don't. I don't have a paper copy of it. Uh, I have an electronic copy of it, but I will put a link down below. It's free online. A uh, paper by Keith and I hope I don't mess this up. Zostack. Zostack. Um, sorry, I apologize if anybody knows him and I butchered his name. Um, I have a hard time with that. Those S Z combinations. I think. Anyway, uh, so they did. This is 2001. They published a paper where they took an 80 residue protein and then they randomized. They randomized all possible combinations of this 80 residue protein, right? Um, just to see. And then they they were looking for they were they were directing towards a particular result. Now, okay, in other words, selection, um, artificial selection in this case. They were looking for ATP binding affinity. Okay, so this is a randomized. This is just every possible amino acid jumbled up randomly. And they, in a sample of 10 to the 12 um, possible combinations, they found four with ATP binding affinity, four. Um, so that works out to be about 
I think 1.2 times 10 to the 11th. Um, one one out of one 1.2 times 10 to the 11th power are the odds of creating a ATP binding based on based on the four that they have. Now they might get more next time they next time the experiments run or let fewer. But the point is, um, they they got four when by these theoretical numbers they shouldn't have gotten one even if they ran the experiment trillions of times for the lifespan of the universe they shouldn't have gotten a single one um they got four uh and now the technique that they describe is used extensively in the biomedical industry for for like creating specific novel proteins i'm you know i mean it, it's a tool that's actually used to to create the like, cancer drugs and stuff like that um, because we know that you can randomize and the ra randomization and then selection uh, tends to guide you towards a, a product. Um, just like in the natural world, whether something adapts better, has a better adaptations to heat, enzymes that function better and look cold or whatever, tend to survive more um, selection. So anyway, so he that that right there, and I figured it out. I worked it out to be, I think it's 5 times 10 to the 90th more likely than Myers numbers allow for. That's huge, okay? Um, so basically, the real world says his numbers are bullshit. Um, so it reminds me a lot of what I was talking about earlier with the, uh, the Schultzenberger, Schultzenberger um, demanding that his model, his model is real. Um, doesn't matter what the real world says. His model, his computer simulation, it's just sort of the same thing. Uh, uh, Meyer's gonna st they stick to their numbers despite the fact that there's experimental proof. I mean, this is actual real world stuff. These things were actually physically created. Um, now you could argue that they were created by a person in a lab, so therefore they don't model reality. But then you know that that's that argument goes on and on um, in infinitely. I think in this this and people, no matter what you do. You you know the the very first time some scientist creates a living cell, following you know in a test tube, but with all the conditions that where it would occur naturally, as if you know it, all the conditions of the ancient Earth, they're going to say, well, it was intelligently designed. The scientist made it, you know. So that's not the point. Though those people are irrelevant. Um, I'm just rambling on. See, why does anybody pay attention to me? I, it's it's a mystery. Um, Anyway, so I I think I'm going to end that. There's a bunch more papers from this. I, I got, like I said, I got all the papers that he cites in that chapter. Uh, he has, I believe he has um, 12 citations, and I've got all the papers and or books that he, he mentions in there. Um, at least the at least the individual papers from the books that he cites rather than the actual hardbound book. Uh, anyway, so you guys have a good one. I will talk to you later.